Um, so welcome to the second lecture of our IEP class on causality, 60091. Uh, for those of you who are taking the class for credit, the first PSET is going to be released today, and then it's due a week from today at 1 p.m. Remember, those should be written in LaTeX, and you should uh, bring a printed copy to class to turn those in. Um, I think it's pretty easy, but it should give you some practice with these concepts. So I definitely encourage you, even if you're just a listener, to kind of like look at what we put in there and think about how you might do those. Um, today's going to be our first lecture out of two on policy evaluation. Um, and then here is the course website in case uh, you didn't catch it last time. Um, I'll also probably email something out. That website is going to have links to uh, lecture videos on YouTube, um, and it also has links to the course notes. So kind of everything that you need is going to be there. The PSET and eventually the PSET solutions will also be posted there, um, and you should probably also be getting something through an email. I think if you've signed up for this, I have you on Canvas. Um, so when I'm talking about policy evaluation, I want to start with a few examples of questions that we might ask um, and kind of give you a flavor of, of what I mean by policy evaluation. Uh, so these are kind of maybe some of the most fundamental questions in causality. Uh, so the first question that we might consider uh, say in the context of economics would be what is the average increase in lifetime earnings uh, so that will just be lifetime earnings uh, for individuals that have a bachelor's degree as opposed to say just Okay, does the microphone still sound good here? Okay. Um, a similar question, more in the context of healthcare, would be for a patient with kidney stones um, is surgery or medicine better? getting rid of those kidney stones. So often this is where we start when asking causal questions where we're considering a binary choice between two different kinds of actions. Um, and that would fall under the general uh, heading of estimating an average treatment effect, which is abbreviated ATE. And that formally is going to be the difference in the expected outcome. So Y will always pretty much be using to denote an, a variable of outcome. In this case, it would be lifetime earnings. In this case, it would be say zero or one, whether or not the kidney stones are eliminated after one month or something. Um, and it's the difference in that expected outcome if I do one of the actions. Um, so we introduce this do notation for probability distributions um, in the last lecture. Now we're just extending it to expected value. So that's the expected value with respect to the probability of y given do a equals one. And the average treatment effect is the difference when I'm considering treatment one versus treatment zero. Um, sometimes this is uh, treatment versus control, so no treatment. Um, that's just a special case of considering the difference between two treatments. So we can make those questions uh, more complex in a number of ways. Um, I'll give you some flavors of two ways that we might want to make the question more complex. Um, so first, we might want to consider, um, instead of these binary value treatments, uh, you know, we could consider uh, 
categorical with more than two categories. We could also consider continuous value treatments. So uh, something like what is the average increase in, say, a country's GDP per, say, X billion dollars of investment in infrastructure. And in the context of healthcare, it's not really that we have one treatment or the other treatment. You can also consider, okay, I have this treatment. Um, say it's a PD-1 inhibitor. This is something that they use to treat breast cancer. Well, I can get people different doses of that. Um, so I actually care about uh, what is the average, say, reduction in tumor size per, say, X milligrams of PD-1 inhibitor. You know, and this can be a non-monotonic function. If I give somebody a ton of this drug, it might kill them. So there's kind of a right amount of this drug to give them, and you want to maximize that. And here, instead of estimating um, an average treatment effect, which is the difference between these two, what we actually need to estimate is some function, say f of x, which is the expected value of the outcome if we set the variable that we're intervening on. Um, so I'll generally be denoting that like A for action. People also sometimes will put in T for treatment. Um, you'll see other things, maybe W as well. I'm going to try to be consistent and use A. Um, so this would be called uh, the dose response curve from kind of our medical example. Okay. All of these uh, quantities are right now averages over kind of everybody in our population. So this isn't saying, oh, I also go and condition on, uh, you know, I see uh, that my patient has a kidney stone of a certain size, or I see, you know, the person I'm deciding whether or not maybe they should go get a bachelor's or just like go immediately to work out of high school. Maybe I see their family income or something, and that actually uh, carries more information. So sometimes, you know, my treatment decision might be different depending on those background attributes of the person. So another direction where we can make this more complicated um, would be estimating a conditional average treatment effect, which is abbreviated Kate. And this is now going to be similar to our average treatment effect, uh, say that we still have just binary um, binary actions. This would be a function where we're looking at the difference between action one, conditioning on some background information, so say S equals S, and then this difference. And now this is going to be a function of the background information, S, instead of a function of the treatment value, A equals to X. Um, so today we're going to develop some of the machinery for answering questions about the ATE. Um, these are going to be more complicated things that we're not going to cover in this course. I just wanted to give these as a reference of kind of what broadly this field means. Yep. Yes, yeah. So this is typically done by saying, uh, especially in the context of um, a treatment like this, uh, potentially that could influence the treatment decision. So a doctor comes in, they look at uh, how big the patient's kidney stones are, and they decide which of these treatments to give them. And then it can also influence uh, how the action affects the outcome. So this is kind of the most typical graph that you'll kind of have in the back of your mind when we're talking about policy evaluation questions. Um, so... Um, 
Uh, yeah, so you can uh, use this graph to address either of these frameworks. Um, so uh, it's just a question about which quantity you want to estimate. So in particular, if you estimate 8, so this is going to be a function f of s, then if you take the average of the Kate over uh, the probability distribution on S, that's just like law of total expectation, you'll get back the ATE. Great, these are good questions. Um, so the question that was raised last time is how all this relates to randomized control trials, which are kind of the gold standard for establishing um, causal claims. So I'm just gonna briefly say uh, if you have a randomized control trial, what that amounts to is picking some portion of the population where you're going to sample their outcomes. So you're going to sample, uh, let me put it up here, I'm going to sample y from the probability. I mean, I'm going to sample all my variables, but if I just look at these outcomes, I'll get this on the marginal. I'll sample this from y given do a equals 1. And similarly, for the other arm of the trial, the people I put in the control group or the people I give the other uh, drug to, um, I'll be sampling it from uh, y given do a equals 0. So I can just immediately use those outputs to establish, you know, create estimates of these quantities just by simple averaging. So this is why it's, you know, randomized control trials are pretty much if you can do them, they are the easiest way to get at estimating this type of quantity. There's still interesting questions there. There's things about the experimental design. So if you give me a big set of patients, do I just flip coins for each of them uh, independently at random? Or should I be a little bit more clever about who I assign to the treatment and the control group to somehow make them balanced? So there's still a lot of questions, even in randomized control trials that people ask. But conceptually, at least, uh, as long as you're using a randomized control trial, you can get the eight just directly from that. Um, so what we're gonna care about is contexts where you can't do a randomized control trial. Um, in these contexts, we often still want to and sometimes are comfortable establishing causal claims. So I think the big one is uh, whether or not you know smoking causes cancer. Well, we've never done, to the best of my knowledge, a randomized control trial where we, you know, get a group of a thousand people and make 500 of them smoke for 10 years and 500 of them not. Um, so what we're doing is potentially uh, getting observational data. So here the background covariates might be something like socioeconomic status that might make you more likely to smoke might also make you more likely to have lung cancer for other reasons besides smoking. So we would call that confounding between that action and the outcome. Um, however, you, the idea is to, uh, and this is what we'll go through today is general methods to do this, uh, take that confounding into account so that you can go from the data that you observe to data that actually has a causal claim to it. Okay, um, and that's going to take some assumptions on what the causal model generating the data is. Uh, so uh, in this kind of section on policy evaluation, uh, remember from the first lecture, uh, this kind of grid of what the difference between policy evaluation, uh, structure learning, and representation learning is. This is going to be the setting where we have kind of the most background knowledge of the system, where we assume ahead of time that we know the causal graph. And now I'm going to start going into uh, how we can go from that causal graph and data to answering questions about the ATE. So the first thing that I'm going to define is just what it means for this causal effect to be identifiable from data. So kind of intuitively what this means is that given the data that I observe, maybe generated from this model without the do intervention, can I establish the interventional query that I want to answer? Um, so the way to formalize that definition, uh, let's say G is an ADMG. 
So this is the causal graph for our structural causal model. So we say P of X given Y do A equals A. So these Y and A are going to be variables which also correspond to nodes in that ADMG. Um, let me finish. Oh, oh, sure. Um, so this was an acyclic directed mixed graph. This was the DAG with bidirected arrows as well. Thanks for clarifying. Um, yep. So this quantity we will say is generally, I'll just say identifiable. Um, if we want to be very specific, then we can say observationally identifiable. to emphasize that we only have observational data, so not data from any interventions. Uh, from G, if for any two structural causal models, let's call them MA and MB, with causal graph G, and the same observational distributions. So let's say the observational distribution, uh, usually we won't have two structural causal models floating around, so I didn't introduce this notation, but I'll just use this to distinguish the uh, observational distributions of the two different structural causal models. So if we have that their observational or entailed distributions, I'll use those terms interchangeably, um, if we have that their distributions are equal, then that will imply that this interventional distribution is equal in both of them as well. All right, so let's give an example of why we might be worried about this, why this isn't just immediately obvious, why it's not always just identifiable. Um, and this is a super simple, silly example, uh, but it gets the point across and it's kind of the basis of like more general um, ways of showing that certain models are not identifiable. So say that our augmented graph looks like this. This was G tilde in the last lecture. Uh, this is the graph that includes the exogenous variables. So there's this just this one epsilon one here. So what is the latent projection? Well, I have all the edges between the endogenous variables in my original graph, plus I add bidirected edges for any two variables, endogenous variables which share the same exogenous parent. So this is my causal graph G, which from last lecture, we were denoting by G tilde of X. Okay, so I'm going to write down two structural causal models that both follow this, uh, that both follow this uh, causal graph. So say I have epsilon one, I just need to define this one Uh, exogenous distribution for epsilon one, and say I have A is equal to epsilon one, and I have Y is equal to epsilon one, and then uh, this is XOR with A. Um, so XOR, if 
either one of these is one, but not the other, this will return one. If they're the same, if it, it's zero, zero, or one, one, this will return zero. So what is the distribution of y in this model, in p of x? Yep. Yeah, it's always zero. So that's a uh, point mass at zero. So the other causal model, MB, same distribution for epsilon one, same assignment, same causal mechanism for A. And then I have, say, Y equals zero always. These have the same observational distribution, same joint distribution PX of A comma Y. But in this model, if I intervene and I set A equal to zero, then the distribution of Y, so probability of X, Y given do A equals zero, that's Bernoulli half so I haven't changed the distribution of epsilon. Uh, yeah, so it's pretty clear this will always just take on the value of epsilon. Um, in this distribution, if I intervene on A and set it equal to zero, the d distribution of Y is still just a point mass at zero. So if my assumptions kind of going into observing my data were that my causal graph looks like this, and uh, I observed enough data, say, to estimate the joint distribution of A and Y well, um, then I couldn't tell between these two models. I couldn't tell what would happen if I were to intervene and set A equal to zero. And the essential problem with this example um, is that the variable A and the outcome Y are kind of directly confounded by this exogenous variable. Um, so if I were to instead have something like this as my causal graph, where I actually observe the variable that's confounding them, then my quantity is going to be identifiable. And the tools that we'll use today will let us go past these kind of like case-by-case -case basis of uh, just looking at one graph like this, we'll be able to take in kind of a general um, ADMG and tell whether or not the quantity that we want to figure out is identifiable. Yep. So, is the assumption here that all endogenous variables are observational? Yes, yes. Right now I'm working with all endogenous variables being observed. Right. Yep. Yeah. All endogenous variables. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So uh, let's first, as a warm up, prove that this uh, graph, that our uh, p of y given do a equals a, is in fact identifiable. So uh, this will be our first theorem today. So we'll say suppose. P of x um, comes from a structural causal model with causal graph we'll just call this maybe G star so that we remember it's special um, G star. Now I'll give you not just the fact that it's identifiable, but also how you can identify it from your data. So this would be called um, an identification formula. So this side will involve our interventional quantity, and we want the right side to only observe, only involve 
uh, quantities from our observed distribution. So we'll sum over the possible values of s. Here I'm just writing out everything as if it's discrete, but you can extend this to continuous or mix or whatever type of variables that you want. So this is, we're going to weight each of these probabilities by the probability that x takes on this value little s. What we've done here is add conditioning on s and change the do operator to conditioning. So it's pretty simple to prove. First, if we take this, it's just a probability distribution, so we can expand it out as we normally would uh, via the law of total probability, which is equivalent to just uh, marginalizing over S and just writing that joint distribution inside in a certain way. So this is probability of Y if I add in conditioning on S and then I multiply by the probability of S in that same distribution. Okay, so here's the trick is that, you know, this already looks very much like the line above. Uh, what I need to do is change this to conditioning and I need to get rid of that uh, do operator. Um, so the first thing is going to be that um, we can just get rid of that uh, do operator immediately because uh, from the last lecture we talked about uh, consistency uh, or um, yeah consistency of these distributions. So if we're only intervening on a certain variable a then the distribution of all the other variables given their parents. So this is a specific conditional distribution. The distribution of each of these variables given their parents will remain invariant. And this, I mean, it looks like it's being conditioned on, but really remember this is notation for this uh, px of i, this interventional distribution, where we're just using this notation to denote that our intervention is a do intervention that sets a equal to this value little a. And that is exactly the variable s without, like given its parents, because it has no parents in this graph. This one requires a little more work because if we were to write out it in this form, we would get y given s which is not both of its parents. We need A as its parent as well. Well, luckily, A, we have uh, this do operator. And if we have a do operator, we always have A equal to this value, little a. So we can, without loss of generality, add in conditioning on A equals A here. And then this becomes the right quantity so that I can complete the proof. And this is something we'll generally kind of take for granted. I just wanted to do it um, kind of carefully once, is that uh, if you're conditioning on a variable, like all of its parents, except for the ones that you're intervening on, but you're intervening on all the rest of the parents, then that kind of replacement formula, that consistency, applies equally well, because you can always just do this trick. It is a property of both the causal graph G and the quantity that you want to identify. So you can have a causal graph where uh, one of the values 
you know, where some of these quantities are identifiable and some other ones aren't. Like in this example, if I just wanted uh, the probability of trivially like a, given that I do a equals a, that's always going to be identifiable. Um, there will be more interesting cases for kind of more complex graphs. Um, so yeah, it's a function of both of those. Um, all right, and just a remark on this formula. So this is an important formula if you're doing kind of causality for, you know, especially stuff like healthcare data. Um, this is the one that you're usually going to use, and then the uh, problem is going to be fitting these probabilities correctly, getting good estimates of those. That will take you more into like the stat side of these problems rather than this kind of, you know, graph theoretic identifiability side. Um, this formula, if it holds for some set S, where now this set doesn't need to be in this particular graph, but just, you know, some other set. So uh, let S be such that uh, the formula star holds, and we'll call F, call S an adjustment set. This is the focus of like a lot of types of identification results is uh, in terms of finding an adjustment set and then using it in this formula. There are other ways to identify the quantity. Uh, we'll cover one of those ways. Um, but the one that we'll be building towards today is uh, a special criterion for uh, S being an adjustment set that's called uh, backdoor adjustment or the backdoor criterion. And this will be kind of a generalization of uh, this uh, variable S um, in more complicated graphs. And the uh, place that the name backdoor comes from is that there are kind of two paths in this graph from A to Y. So there's this direct causal path, and then there's this path through S. Um, and that's going to be called a backdoor path. And uh, the part of the criterion is going to be that our set S kind of blocks all backdoor paths. Um, and we'll talk about what blocking means. Um, that's what we're building up to today. Great. Any questions so far? All right. So this is going to be kind of a windy course to get to uh, the backdoor criterion, which we'll uh, probably culminate the lecture with. Um, but first, we're going to talk about undirected graphs. Um, and then we'll see uh, that those are kind of indispensable tools for talking about directed graphs. It will make a lot of the kind of things that we want to reason about easier. So, I'm going to let G be an undirected graph, which I'll abbreviate UG. This is just a graph where instead of the edges having arrows on them, they only have lines, there's no arrows, all the edges are undirected. Um, so say this is an uh, undirected graph on some set of nodes x, a clique in this graph is a set of nodes such that for all pairs of nodes in that set, they are adjacent. So 
So it can't have any edges missing between any of the uh, two nodes in that set. And we will denote by a calligraphic C of this graph the set of all clicks. So for example, for a graph there's this little square. The cliques on this graph are going to be the collection of sets x1 and x2, x2 and x3, x3 and x4, and so on. Now, if I added an edge, like if I added that x2 to x4 edge, now x1, x2, x4 would be one clique, and x2, x3, x4 would be another clique. But not all four nodes, since they do have this missing edge. So x1 and x3 cannot be in the same clique. So we'll return to this example in a bit. And the important thing about cliques is that they give us a way to relate undirected graphs and probability distributions. Um, and that's going to be as follows. So we're going to say that a distribution Px factorizes according to an undirected graph G if we have some functions, there exist functions phi C where these are indexed by the cliques of the graph such that we can write the distribution over x as a product of these functions. So, for example, let us have this probability distribution over x1, x2, x3, and x4, which is equal to, uh, let's say these are all binary variables, and we'll actually just have this be proportional, um, because uh, the right-hand side might not define a probability distribution. We might need to sum up over all the values and then divide by that, so normalize it to actually get a probability distribution. The right-hand side will have this unnormalized probability distribution that has each of these factors, one for each of the cliques. So that is going to be an example of a distribution that factorizes with respect to the causal graph that we wrote up there. Great, so in order to start building from that factorization, which is kind of this uh, clique-related property to uh, properties that are kind of, I guess cliques are graph theoretic, uh, what we want is to characterize these distributions in terms of separations in the graph, um, which is also what we'll be doing when we're talking about uh, directed graphs, and uh, that will lead us to things like being able to say that a certain set blocks all the backdoor paths. Um, we're going to need a kind of fundamental lemma that relates uh, this type of factorization to, um, to separations. Um, so first, uh, we'll relate factorizations to conditional independences. So 
So if we have some sets that this is all going to be in terms of just this uh, probability distribution P of X, the graph won't be included in this lemma. If we have uh, the A is conditionally independent of B given S, recall that means uh, the probability distribution of A and B given S factorizes as probability of A given S, probability of B given S. So if this holds true, uh, this is actually an if and only if, uh, there exists two functions, H1 and H2, such that the joint distribution of all three of these variables can be written as uh, H1, which just depends on A and S, and H2, which just depends on B and S. So the forward implication is very easy, just from this characterization, because uh, this joint distribution I can get by multiplying both sides by probability of S, and then I can multiply either one of these, say the one for B, by the probability of S, and it's still just something that depends on B and S. So in particular, this would be our H1, and this would be our H2. Uh, the reverse is a little bit more tricky, but not too much more. So what we have to do first, um, like consider that we actually do have that. Now we want to get rid of A and get rid of B and see what we get. So first, getting rid of A, integrate over sum over the values of A on both sides. So we'll get just the probability of BS is going to be equal to, uh, so we'll sum out all of the terms that depend on A. So this will give us a new function that just depends on S. And then this doesn't depend on A at all, so that will just remain in place. Similarly, this will give us, if we take B out, H1 of AS alpha 2 of S. And then I can manipulate this a little bit so I can see that H1 is equal to probability of A comma S divided by alpha 2 of S. Similarly, on the other side, technically to do all of this rigorously, you need to check that uh, you're not using any values for which these functions, any values of S for which these functions take on the value zero. Um, but those won't really matter for our definition of conditional independence because that only needs to hold on values of S where uh, S, the probability of S does not equal zero. Um, so everything's kosher if you want to check those things, but this proof is just kind of assuming um, all values of S have positive probability, um, which you could just do by restricting the domain of S. So H1 is equal to uh, this distribution divided by this. H2 is equal to this distribution divided by this alpha 1. If we plug those in, that's going to give us that uh, this joint distribution A, B, S is equal to uh, the distribution of A and S, distribution of B and S divided by the alpha 1 of S, alpha 2 of S. Okay, and then this is kind of looking like it might be the right thing. Um, now what we would need to do is see that uh, if we brought this over to the right-hand side and then, or the left-hand side and then integrated out A and B, what we would get is alpha 1 of S alpha 2 of S, probability of S equals, now we're integrating out A, we're integrating out B, so this is probability of S squared. One of those is going to cancel, so this is going to be the probability of S. 
Right, and then the rest is just plugging this in. So now if we know that this is equal to uh, P of S, then uh, we can uh, achieve uh, this equality um, just by dividing, say, the first term by this P of S and then dividing both sides, this term and this term, by P of S as well. That was kind of quick, but I didn't want to harp too much on the details. Did that make sense? Uh, yes, this is just the reverse direction. And basically, it just says that, like, you know, when you have variables that are independent given S, yep. then the probability. The probability distribution factorizes. Yep, yep, exactly. Um, and the, the reverse is kind of the more helpful thing for us, is so that um, now instead of having to establish basically every time that we want to show conditional independence that this equality holds, we can work with this simpler equality. We don't really care that H1 and H2 now are probability distributions, whereas here they have to be probability distributions. So this is kind of a tool just to make things easier to show. Great. Nope. Um, I don't know what you mean by contained probability distributions. Uh, the product H1 times H2 needs to be a probability distribution. But what this is saying is, you know, this could integrate to 5 and this could integrate to like 1 fifth or whatever. Like, so you can have these factors that cancel out. Yeah. Okay. So we'll return to using that in a second. Um, we're going to define an alternative way of relating our probability distributions to undirected graphs. And then we'll actually show that these two ways are pretty much equivalent. At least one way implies the other way. So. If we have an undirected graph G, let's say on nodes X again, um, if we let A be an S be disjoint subsets of X, um, then we say S separates A and B if all paths from <coughs> A, so any node starting in A, this path begins there, to B have to go through Uh, so, for example, if A equals just our node X1 in this, and it B equals our node X3, then those are going to be separated by the set S equals X2, X4, because any of the paths that we want to take to get from X1 to X3 have to pass through at least one of those nodes. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Uh, unfortunately, it's more complicated for directed graphs, which is what we're spending most of today doing. Um, okay, and uh, I'm going to introduce some notation. So we're going to uh, have uh, this is going this is going to be denoted. I denoted uh, conditional independence this way in a probability distribution. I'm going to. Uh, do something similar for graphs, and this is why we had that subscript. So I want to say A is independent now with G in the subscript. So this is going to say that A and B are separated in G. That's what this notation will denote. And uh, given a graph G, we'll also be interested in the set of all 
A, B, and S that are separated in that graph. Um, and this subscript is because I'll be using calligraphic I for other stuff later on. So this is just going to remind ourselves that this is uh, talking about the independences of this graph, or the, the separations of this graph. Um, and uh, similarly, for uh, distribution, we'll have I independent P of X is going to denote all sets of variables A, B, and S such that A is conditionally independent of B given S. Now this is giving us our second way of relating uh, undirected graphs and distributions, which is uh, called Markovianity. So if our distribution um, P of X, uh, let's just jump immediately to the condition. Um, so we'll say uh, if all of the independences, or sorry, all of the separations in the graph are also conditional independences in this distribution, uh, we call P of X Markov. to our undirected graph G. We'll establish similar terminology for directed graphs as well, uh, but we'll go through this first. Um, so this is also something to take note of, something people get tripped up on um, at the beginning, is which direction this implication goes in. Um, so a few remarks to say. Um, what we're saying is that if two things are separated in the graph, they also have to be conditionally independent. Some trivial ways to satisfy this would be uh, if P of X is a product, product distribution, so everything is independent of each other, all conditional independencies hold, that a product distribution will be Markov with respect to all graphs. Um, it will have additional conditional independent statements, which are maybe not reflected in the graph. So this is just a subset relation. Um, if we want this to be an equality relation, that's a much stricter condition, and that's known as faithfulness, which we won't need um, for the stuff that we're considering today or in the next lecture. Um, that will come up when we're talking about causal structure learning. Um, here, this is just the entailed distribution, just on observed data. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's return to uh, this example. So here was my factorization. Um, I said I was going to have P of X uh, factorized like this. Well, now what I can do, um, maybe I do on this board closer to me, is I can group these terms. So I can have these two terms be a function, um, let's just say, uh, h1 of x1, x2, and x3. And then these two terms can be H2 of X3 um, X3, X4, and X1. 
This is not the one that I was going to do, but this one works equally well. Right, so what's in common between these two is x1 and x3. So if I let s be equal to x1, x3, what I'm seeing here is that I can write this with a equals just x2 and b equals x4. And that uh, from our lemma that we just proved, uh, this is going to tell us that uh, in this probability distribution, um, x2 is independent of x4 um, given x1 and x3. And I didn't leave space for the probability distribution here, so I'll just write it out there. Sometimes you'll see it like that. Um, and this was exactly corresponding to the separation that I had between x2 and x4, given x1 and x3 in this graph. And we'll see that that's no mistake. This generalizes. Um, so that's our next result. Let p of x factorize... according to an undirected graph G, then that distribution is Markov to G. And the proof goes very similarly to that uh, special case. So for some sets A, B, and S fixed, such that A is independent or is separated from B given S in our graph G, we want to show that the fact that it factorizes according to G will also um, imply this specific conditional independent statement. And then we just go over all conditional independent statements to say that it's Markov with respect to G. And the idea here is that we take our graph, say that we have these are our nodes A, these are our nodes S, these are nodes B, and A is connected to B only through S. These might not, you know, completely partition the graph. There might be some other nodes, maybe some nodes connected to A, some nodes connected to B, some other nodes that aren't connected to any of these. Um, so we'll divide this into a partition. We'll just let A prime be equal to, essentially, if we were to remove S out of the graph, just the things that are connected to A. And then we'll let B prime be all of the nodes, which are not either in A prime or S that partitions the graph to A prime, S, and B prime. Um, then since the nodes A and B, and now the sets, or actually A prime and B prime, these sets of nodes are separated by S, then uh, any clique C uh, is a subset either of A prime and S or 
of B prime and S. So say, you know, something like this is a clique between these four nodes. That is going to be a subset of A prime union S. And it's not going to include any nodes from B by the assumption that the nodes from uh, A prime are not connected to the nodes in B prime except through S. Right, so this is going to allow us to, uh, let's define C1 to be uh, the cliques of this graph that are uh, completely inside of A prime and S. And then C2 will just be the rest of the cliques. Um, then what we're going to have is that uh, our factorization in terms of cliques, we're going to be able to split into two parts. So we're going to be able to split into a part that depends just on uh, uh, A prime and S uh, corresponding to these cliques and just a part that uh, correspond, or, yeah, corresponds or depends on B prime and S. So we'll be able to write out from our assumption of factorization that this divides into H1 of A prime and S and H2 of B prime and S, which will establish that a prime is conditionally independent of B prime given S by our lemma. And then we'll just take the subsets on A and B. So if uh, a conditional independence um, holds on uh, two sets of nodes, then it will also uh, hold on the subsets of nodes. I'll try to remember to write those subscripts. OK. Um, so one remark about this uh, proposition we've proved is uh, we're saying that factorization implies Markovianity. Uh, generally, they're pretty close to being equivalent. So um, under some conditions, such as positivity of this distribution, so saying that this distribution takes on positive values for everything in uh, you know, all possible inputs, um, down and away from zero, then Markovianity also implies factorization. We won't need that. Um, that's a much harder result to prove. That's known as the Hammersley-Clifford theorem. Um, and there's kind of different versions that you can prove based on the assumptions that you want to make about P of X. Um, when we get to DAGs, uh, something similar will hold. And we won't need any conditions on the distribution for factorization and Markovianity to be equivalent. So this is something, uh, you know, if you encounter undirected graphs uh, to be aware of, you know, the reverse of this implication, you do need some additional conditions. Okay. So now that we've taken this detour through undirected graphs, I'm going to provide this bridge between undirected graphs and directed graphs. And this will motivate why we introduced undirected graphs in the first place. Are there any questions before we move on? Yep. So I didn't quite follow this property because I was thinking about something else. Yep. What's the, like, I guess the gist of it? I can do the notes later. But... 
um, the proposition of the factorization implying um, implying Markovianity. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is that we start with the assumption, say all we know about this distribution p of x, is that it factorizes according to the undirected graph. So we know that we can write it in this form. Uh, this is going to let us conclude something about the conditional independences in that distribution. In particular, that uh, for any separation in our graph, that separation is going to hold as a conditional independence. Um, so it's like a tool that allows us to go from factorization, which might be easier to prove, to conditional independences. Okay, so we'll follow kind of a similar path for DAG models um, by defining factorization first. So let G be a DAG on these nodes X. And we say P of X factorizes according to G if we can write P of X again as a product. Now we don't have to introduce cliques. We'll just do a product over the nodes. And then it will be the conditional distribution of each node given its parents in this graph. So we saw these conditional uh, distributions show up before when we talked about the entailed distribution of a structural causal model. Um, so this is uh, no coincidence. Uh, basically, it, this is a claim. If uh, Px is the entailed distribution of some structural causal model, with causal graph, G, then P of X factorizes according to G. And here we've kind of honed in just on DAG models. Uh, you can define a corresponding type of factorization for uh, acyclic, direct acyclic directed mixed graphs, so graphs with those bidirected edges. Um, it's no longer going to be over nodes. Um, and all that I'm going to be proving today from here on out is going to be involving DAGs. Um, so a lot of the concepts kind of translate over to ADMGs. Um, but the proofs for DAGs are going to be easier and kind of give us the gist of the main ideas. OK. And now we'll provide that bridge from uh, directed graphs to undirected graphs. So if we have a DAG. G, then the moral graph of G which is denoted by G bar I'll try to make it clear that I'm using this bar instead of the tilde that we were using for the 
uh, augmented graph. Um, so this G bar uh, is an undirected graph with the edge xi to xj if either we actually do have this edge, a directed version of it in G, or there exists some node xk such that xi is and xj are both parents of k. And um, if we have some edge uh, xi to xj that is in g bar, but not our dag g, we call that edge a marriage. Um, so this comes from the idea that uh, these two nodes have the same child, uh, but they're not married. So we marry them in the moral graph. Um, before they're married, it's called an immorality. And we make it moral uh, by marrying everybody who has the same children. Um, so a bit of interesting terminology. Uh, I guess it's also weird because you can have a bunch of nodes with the same children. So I guess you'll get a lot of marriages. Uh, nodes can be involved in multiple marriages, um, so on. So remember the graph that we were thinking about for the mouse experiment that we discussed in lecture one. So we had these edges. Now, I guess Mickey and Minnie weren't married, so we marry them to get the moral graph. And then we just kind of delete all of the, um, all of the arrows. OK. Now we're getting places. Um, so first, we'll establish a connection between factorization in the directed graph and factorization in the moral graph. Um, and it's actually super clear from the definition of the moral graph that these two are related. So, if P of X factorizes according to a DAG G, then it factorizes according to its moral graph, G bar. And all we're going to do is use the definition of factorization in a DAG model um, and just kind of squeeze those together into terms uh, that don't look like conditional probability distributions anymore. Yep. Yep. Undirected graphs. Yeah. Directed graphs. Yeah. Uh, precisely. So um, big thing in graphical models is that any different type of graphical model, um, you'll get a different notion of factorization and a different uh, notion of uh, separation. So we talked about separation in undirected graphs. We'll also get a notion of separation 
that's different in directed graphs. Um, yeah, so that's part of the, the deal when you deal with graphical models. Uh, so this is why, at least in uh, what I've done so far, I'm trying to uh, make clear uh, what uh, type of model um, we're using. So I'll always say it factorizes according to an undirected graph or a DAG. Um, there are some classes of graphs um, where it's like, say, a mixed graph where you allow for directed edges bidirected edges, and undirected edges. Um, so there it can be unclear because you could have a graph in that class that happens to only have undirected edges or happens to only have directed edges. So there people will get more careful about saying, um, you know, blank type of factorization or blank type of separation. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be pretty clear from context. OK, um, so all I'm doing here is I'm defining some set C that uh, I don't know if y'all recall from our lecture on, uh, on Tuesday that this bar notation over the parents is inclusive. So that means the parents of x union with the node x itself. Um, so this is just the set or the collection of sets. Um, consisting of all nodes unioned with their parents. Um, so C, like for C and C, is a clique. In G bar, um, because of that moralization that we've done, um, so all of the uh, uh, nodes were all of the parents of xi were obviously already connected to xi in the graph. We keep those edges, and then we also put edges between all of the parents, and that makes uh, this whole set a clique. And then basically all we do is a change of notation. So we write out this factorization xi given parents of xi, and we just define uh, psi c. And I'm not going to write out all of the arguments and stuff, but uh, psi c of xi comma parents of xi equals that conditional distribution. <laughs> 